Xenophilia, noun, an attraction or love of all eigen people, manners or culture. Hm, <laughs> doesn't sound too bad. I wonder why people make such a fuss about this fiction. I guess I just check it out for myself. Okay, that was... something. If you don't enjoy human and equestria stories, stay away from this fiction. If you are uncomfortable with club fictions, stay away from this fiction. If you don't want to read a more than 100,000 word long story of interspecies relationships with detailed descriptions of the act of intercourse and taking place in a polygamous society in the name of Luna, in the name of chaos, the swarm and the homo sparkly blandness known as the Crystal Empire, stay away from this fiction. But you're very welcome to stay here and listen to me analyzing it. But first, bravo, you did it. You told me over and over again how horrible and traumatizing this story is that I eventually got curious and picked it up. And because I couldn't find a dramatic reading of it, you made me actually sit down and read a Klopfig. I am not going to pretend that I have never come into contact with Klopfigs before. On the contrary, every now and then I enjoy listening to a reading of one because... Holy horse apples! Most of them are hilarious! If you are not grossed out by the content itself banging MLP characters, and it is really difficult to gross me out, one of the reasons why I got curious about Xenophilia to begin with. Those stories have a certain entertainment factor the various authors probably had not in mind while writing their stories. They are funny! Putting sex into words is a horrible idea. Sleeping together is a kinesthetic experience. It is all about the sensation of feeling each other. Visuals play a role as well because they can be very stimulating, but describing those sensations, putting them into words? No matter how good a writer you are, it will always end up at least a bit weird. And let's face it, most Klopfig authors are not even close to JK Rowling levels of writing. So, was Xenophilia an exception? No. I actually burst into laughter multiple times during reading. But not only the awkwardness of certain scenes made me laugh, but also the writing in general. The way the, how the narrator and the human character, for that matter, I'm getting to him later, are struggling to be as sophisticated and subtle as possible about all the action going on. All the contrivances and conveniences, the sheer ridiculously conflict and eventless development of the story. We are talking so bad it is good levels here. <sighs> and this is such a shame. Because the anonymous author had some really amazing and thought-provoking ideas. The world building happening between the sex scenes, and often enough even in the middle of such scenes, has actually potential. And I'm apparently not the only one who sees more than just another Klopfig. Xenophilia is the tenth most viewed story on all of film fiction. It has 4608 thumbs up and only 113 thumbs down. This is a ratio of 36 to 1, what is pretty good for such a high profile story. My Little Dashi may have over 390,000 views but got only 8,700 thumbs up and 440 thumbs down. This makes far less thumbs up per view, not to mention a ratio of only 20 to 1. So, what is so intriguing about that story that does not make it just another Klopfig? The author plays with the idea that the equestrian society is pretty much like ours, but upside down. The imbalanced male to female ratio that can be observed especially during the earlier seasons of the series and that I myself talked about in my fourth ask video is taken as fact as well as the matriarchal structure of society. As a consequence, males have to bow the stallions and the latter are considered the protect worthy gender even though stallions are still the stronger sex. There is even an inverse form of sexism when a mayor asks the human why he is not in the bedroom or the fields. Another example is the line, you don't hit guys. 
especially due to the fact that the author places a human from our patriarchal society in that scenario and gets him romantically involved with some mayors, a wonderful contrast is created that kind of provokes the reader to reflect on the way how the gender roles in our world work. Then again, those really interesting aspects do not really build up to anything. They are just there and they are framed by crop scenes. I have the feeling that the author had a lot of random ideas, headcanons and fantasies and tried to cram all of them into one fiction. Very detailed, sexual and also heartwarmingly romantic fantasies are side by side with expositional world building dialogue and a tiny bit of slice of life. That alone could still somehow work, even so I would usually recommend to keep intense world building and clop in separate fictions. Both elements might spoil the enjoyment for readers who are interested in the other aspect. But in addition, Xenophilia lacks a real story. It starts in media race. The human Lero has already been in Equestria for quite a while, made some friends, found a job and has got his own house. The very first scene is that Lero and his best friend Rainbow Dash are just chilling outside when Rainbow suddenly kisses him. After some very long winding and nauseatingly pretentious talk about why Rainbow is not a skinny garnish over muscled freak, but instead someone who is slender, athletic, colorful and unusual, they pretty much get things going. Not without a few more philosophical rambling breaks in between. From there it is just a constant switch between harmless slice of life settings and discovering new ways of banging, with squeezed in world building and exploring the differences between the two species and their respective societies. Every now and then we get hints towards existing conflicts, but they pretty much resolve themselves right away and do not really go anywhere. An interesting narrative needs conflict. This can even be something completely mundane like having stage fright before a performance. But each conflict in Xenophilia just happens to end well before any tension could build up. Even the one big question being a part of every human in Equestria story, how did he end up there, gets never really addressed until close to the end. Then we suddenly get told that Lyra actually arrived in Ponyville rounded and in torn and bloodstained clothes. But don't worry, I'm not spoiling anything except the disappointment. Because this information every pony except the reader already shared anyways builds once again up to nothing. It is just thrown in and immediately dismissed by Celestia who explains, now I know how you got here, but it is better for you not to know, so I will not tell you. And the little information the reader does get about Lero's transfer to Equestria hints towards a really cool idea about what happened. Screw all the sex and the idealized romance, I want to hear that story! Talking about idealized romance. Leroy, oh Luna, is he another Marty Stew? He is very sophisticated, understanding and empathic. He is a handyman, a masseur and a brilliant cook. He could actually earn a lot of money, but he decides to keep room for his passions. He can totally stand up for himself, but entrusts himself to Rainbow's guidance. Not to mention he is athletic, highly intelligent and, to put it simple, absolutely flawless. What does the Urban Dictionary say about Marty Stu again? An annoyingly perfect male fanfiction character. He is usually attractive, misunderstood, angsty and even has some sort of tragic past. He is so perfect as to be nauseating. He usually winds up romantically involved with one or more of the author's favorite characters. Saves the day, upstages all the real characters, etc. Marty Stews tend to be slightly less common than Mary Sue's, often involving in slash fix. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? By the way, Leo is short for Bellerophon, a hero from the Greek mythology who tamed a Pegasus. Oh, anonymous author, I see what you did there. An interesting aspect to mention is one paragraph in the very beginning of the story, right after Rainbow first confessed her feelings for Leroy by kissing him, in which he enters a long winded dinner monologue about the nature of such a relationship. He reaches the conclusion that it is not bestiality, but wait for it. Xenophilia! This is as far as I can recall the only scene we ever enter his perspective and hear his thoughts. From there on after everything is told from Rainbow's perspective. This shouldn't be a problem, right? There are amazing stories even from a first person perspective that don't feel constructed, right? Uh, in case of Xenophilia everything happens live. No summaries, flashbacks or re-narrations. 
This means nothing ever happens when Rainbow is not around. This goes even so far that later on in a scene in which Rainbow is not directly involved at all, she gets loaded with work and placed in the next room as a silent observer, just so the reader can witness one more social interaction of the adult kind in great detail. And about those great details, something I should probably mention since it stood out to me. The author seems to have spent a lot of time thinking about the human equian intercourse. Facts like that face to face is kind of deviant for ponies, that shoulders are some kind of taboo zone, and the inconvenient height difference between the two species are addressed in the novel, just to name a few. If this kind of delving deeply into that particular subject matter is a pro or a con, every pony has to decide for themselves. Now for the reading recommendation. <laughs> Tricky one. As I said in my opening, if you don't like human and equestria, clop, human pony intercourse or polyamory, definitely give this one a pass. If you are looking for a deep, well put together narrative, same advice. So who should actually read the story? You need to be at least open for a lot of human mounts horse if you catch my drift. If you're actually into club fiction, even better. Where this story really shines is the world building. It is probably extreme alienating for the more conservative readers, but if you are open minded and willing to get your perception of our world's gender role challenge, damn, this story has a few hidden gems to offer. Even so, there are also some ideas that make you want to play around face meets tabletop. You remember that scene from Hearts and Hoofs Day? Yeah, in Xenophilia movable houses are not just a very cartoony one-time joke, but canon. Well, to be fair, even my absolute favorite fictions have their really stupid moments, so I probably already reached nitpicking level. And of course, last but not least, if you are into cheesy idealized romance, you are also in luck. And I don't mean this in a degradatory way. It is just a question of how honest you are with yourself. I, for example, admit openly that I love stupid, over-the-top action film violence. Well, that's all I have to say about this piece of literature. This is the ANY Pony saying, oh, uh, I totally forgot. The mysterious anonymous author is most likely a woman. Anyways, see you soon. Bye.